Absolutely. So I've been teaching this series entitled Behold and Honor. And we found two really significant things about the word behold and then the word honor. My message today is called God Beheld Us and God Honored Us. God beheld us and God honored us. And what we learned several weeks back was when Jesus was on the cross, he turned to John, his disciple, and he said, John, behold your mother. And he pointed to his own mother, Mary. Jesus said to John, behold your mother. And the word behold in the Greek is idu, and uh, it means to see. To behold. But it, it goes a lot deeper than just seeing someone on the surface. I can see you, but not really see you. And there's a sense of being seen that brings an understanding of who we are as people. In the Webster Dictionary, the definition of to behold is to perceive, to comprehend, to recognize. Now listen, to decipher, to decode, to dig deep, to discern, to register, to understand. You see, Jesus said to John, I want you to behold. I want you to look at this woman and though she's not your biological mom, you didn't grow up with her, but I want you to understand her. I want you to understand what it would feel like for this woman to have given birth to me, and here she is watching me be crucified. I want you to look into her and see and decode and decipher her and learn to look beyond what you see on the surface and see who she is deep down inside. How many of you want people to behold you? in that sense of the word. Absolutely. Too often, relationship is as shallow as the surface of what we see in one another. For relationship to go deep, we have to go deep in our getting to know the other person. And so when Jesus said, behold, the word behold means to discern, to decipher, to decode. If you've lived long enough, you would know that there are some people you just have to totally decode. We have to get to understand each other. Jokes fly left, right, center, all over the place about a man trying to decode a woman and what a woman is, and for a, man, a woman to decode who a man is. And if we're going to have relationship, we have to understand we are different. Male and female, we are different. And we need to decode and understand and decipher. And relationship will only be as successful as the time and the effort that we take to understand people from their perspective. Another thing about the word behold is that I look beyond how a person is acting and I decipher them. Every one of us is made up of accumulation of the things we've been taught, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, sometimes prejudiced, sometimes accurate. And we have knowledge and we have slanted knowledge. We have knowledge and we have incorrect knowledge. And we look at people based on our experiences in life and what we have experienced with them. And the Bible teaches us to decode, to look beyond the surface and to look deep down into a person's heart and into their circumstance. When a person is acting crazy, which we all do from time to time, it depends on what button you press. You see, right now I'm in preacher mode, so you're seeing the best of me. But there are times where people press other buttons that I like to keep hidden, and the not best of me comes out. Does anybody have one of those buttons? Does anybody have more than one of those buttons? Anybody got a whole heap of those buttons? Come on, let's just be honest. 
Most of us are like the rest of us. And the reality is that we deal with people based on how they act when their buttons are pressed. And we say, you know, this is crazy. Or this person is really broken. And the word behold means to go beyond what you see on the surface, to go beyond the reaction, go beyond the hurt, go beyond the crazy, and understand, decode, decipher, and appreciate how they got to where they are. And so that's the first thing we learned. The word decode, uh, to behold, means to understand, to dig deep, to discern, to decipher, and to decode. Then we saw that the word be, uh, honor, to give honor to your mother and your father, is the Greek word timeo, and it means to assign value. Now, I'm going to take this with me. So often in, in life, and we, we, we coin this phrase, and I think you've all said it at some time or another, give honor where honor is due. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that? How many of you try to live by that? A few hands. You give honor where honor is due. The interesting thing about this Greek word, timeo, it means to honor, but it means to assign honor. And here's the point, and this is what we learned a few weeks back, and it's this. In this world, we give honor where honor is due. In God's world, God gives honor even when honor hasn't been due. I look at myself, Dana, and I think about the fact the reason why it's amazing grace is because God gave me honor even though I didn't deserve honor. You see, from God's world, honor always speaks up to us. In the demonic world, demons will speak the language of condemnation and they will always talk down to us. And they'll always tell us what we're not and what we should be and where we failed and why we're going to fail again. Demons will talk down to us. Humans will talk down to us. But God always talks up to us. Have you ever noticed that? God's always telling us how much he loves us. Listen, there's a whole heap of things God could talk about when it comes to Rob Scarallo. But he doesn't. He only chooses to talk about the best things. He chooses to talk about who I am in Jesus Christ. You see, if you talk about somebody based on their performance, you will help them to keep performing what they've been performing. But when you talk up to somebody, you clothe them with honor. You are putting honor even where honor may not have been attained. And when we clothe someone with honor, we release in them the ability, the incentive, the encouragement, and the power to act according to what we are saying about them. Amen. And that's exactly what God does with each and every one of us. He talks up to us. He calls us his beloved. He calls us co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Jeff, can you imagine that? What have you done to earn the right to be a co-heir with Jesus Christ? And if I've done anything to earn the right, I've done 10 times more to lose the right. You see, God gives honor even where honor isn't due. Why? The language of heaven the language of God's spirit realm is a language that always lifts us up and never puts us down. He will clothe us in garments of praise. He will clothe us in garments of honor. And so when the Bible says honor your father and your mother, it's not saying honor them because they've been honorable. That's what we assume. And so every Mother's Day or Father's Day, people, some people have great difficulty because they haven't had good experiences with their mother or their father. We're all broken. The only way you could give honor in a world of broken people is to behold them, to look beyond the ugly, 
to look beyond the reactions, to be, look beyond the annoyances and start to understand their past and what broke them and brought them to this place of being so messed up. And when we start to behold, when we behold, like the Bible says, to behold, when we start to behold, it starts to build in us an appreciation of where the other person has been and where they're coming from, and it increases our ability to respect them and eventually even love them. And so to behold enables us eventually to give honor even though honor isn't due. Come on, am I saying anything that's good? Am I preaching to you? Because I know I'm preaching to me. Absolutely. And so we learned these two things at the beginning of this series. To behold, to look beyond the broken and understand, to decode and to decipher. And it helps me when I do that to have a better appreciation of the people that are pressing my buttons. Now, I know you don't have any people that ever press your buttons. In fact, you don't have any buttons, right? <laughs> when we behold, it enables us to give honor, to ascribe honor. The word ascribe means to take a tool and literally scribe, to write upon them words of honor. God ascribes honor to us. He has made me a son, even though I used to be a sinner. He has elevated me and made me a co-heir with Jesus Christ. He calls me his beloved, and he sits me down with Jesus at his right hand side. Isn't that pretty awesome? And so this is what we learned. My message this morning the title concentrates on how God treated us. He beheld us and he honored us. And so to establish this point, I want you to follow me, come with me as I read a few scriptures and start to break it down. And why this is important is this. When we learn the principles of God and then we practice the principles of God, we get the kind of results God gets. You see, it's one thing to pray, God, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But heaven happens the way heaven happens because God operates in principles that are different than how we operate. And if I want God's will to happen on earth as it happens in heaven, I have to live by God's principles also. Hello? And so I'm revealing a principle to you which is very, very important. God beheld us and he honored us. So here we go. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. It says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock, and everything that creepeth on the earth. Now, after the fall in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were given an alternative. They chose not to trust God. They chose to take offense at a suggestion that was made to them. And they dishonored God by not beholding him in the fullness of who he is. They didn't behold God. They didn't look at God and say and realize he's perfect. He's brilliant. He can't be wrong. His will is always the absolute best for me. Instead, what they did was they looked to Lucifer who was tempting them, seducing them, tricking them, betraying them, and he put a wedge in their ability to see. And he actually obscured the image of God. We were created in the image of God. When our image of God is obscured, it obscures the image of who we are and how we see ourselves. Absolutely. 
And so Lucifer was trying to damage the image of God and damage the image of man. And so Adam and Eve believed that God was actually holding something good from them. He was holding back. He was hanging on to the best part and just giving Adam and Eve the dregs. And they took the bait and they beheld God in a distorted, perverted view. And what happened was, the Bible says that Adam and Eve inadvertently gave Lucifer and the kingdom of darkness the authority, the power, and the right to rule the earth that they were given. And they surrendered it to the enemy. And that's why Jesus says Satan is the God of this world. That's going to change. How many of you are waiting for that change? In the restoration of all things, there's a doctrine that never gets preached in the church. It's called the restoration of all things or in the renewal. Jesus is coming back and at a given appointed time, the whole earth will be recreated and God will bring all the disorder back into divine order. Come on, Jesus, right? Come on, Jesus. It's happening. But God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. We were created in the very image of God. You know, when God created the elephant, it was very different than when he created man. He didn't create the elephant in his image. He didn't create the giraffe in his image. The dolphins, as beautiful as they are and as intelligent as they are, they were not created in the image of God. But God's intention for humanity was to bring us to another level. And what you see in humanity today is not what God saw in humanity in his heart when he fashioned and decided to create human beings. When he decided to create human beings, he said, we're going to create them in our image. But when Adam and Eve allowed their vision and their image of God to be distorted, they fell, and the Bible said, as Lucifer took over the earth, man fell into sin, and he fell from the glory. He fell from the honor. He fell from the integrity. He fell from that nature that was fashioned to look like and smell like and feel like the very heart of God. And so, today... The reason why you turn on the TV and you watch the news and you see one atrocity after another, you see one devastation after another, you see wars and rumors of wars, conflict within different culture groups and different nationalities, and then you see conflict within people's own homes. And we read about all of these devastating things that are happening. Why? Because man has become broken after the fall. Man has lost that image of God. He is a broken, <laughs> a broken mess. How many of you would agree the world is getting crazy? Now watch this here. John chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, God so loved the world. Heck, I want to tell you something, Chris. I turn on the TV and watch the news, and I don't always fall in love with the world that I'm seeing. We can watch the news, and irrespective of what political spectrum you come from, this side thinks that side's crazy, and that side is convinced this side is crazy. And the truth of the matter is, the world is broken. But the mere fact that the Bible says God uh, so loved the world means that God beheld us. God looked beyond our brokenness. God deciphered us. God decoded us. God saw where we were broken, when we were broken, how we got broken, and he understands how that brought us to where we are, and he loved us. You see, when we, be, when we take time to give people the dignity of actually beholding them, understanding them, looking into their heart, irrespective of the crazy on the outside, when we look beyond the hurt, the trauma, and all the, the gunk that they've lived through, it increases and enables us 
to have the ability to have a compassion and an understanding. Can I get an agreement? God so loved the world. He saw us in our brokenness and he decoded us, he deciphered us, each one of us individually. The reason why God hasn't rolled you up into a spitball and shot you out of a straw is because God sees how you were hurt. God sees how you were disappointed. God sees how you were rejected. God sees how you were manipulated. And he looks beyond our faults and he sees our need and he loves us. Come on, somebody give God a a praise offering. God so loved the world, he beheld you. He decoded you. He deciphered you. If anybody will understand you, God will. People who know me and know me well have often, at times, rejected me. And they've rejected you. And sometimes the people we put the most confidence in and we want to build the closest relationships with are sometimes the very arenas where we get hurt and devastated the most. God understands us, irrespective of how we were broken, where we were broken, why we were broken, when we were broken. God beholds us and he loves us. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And because he beheld us, he he was able to love us. And when he loved us, he made a decision that he would clothe himself with flesh and come to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. And he would pay the price for our sin. He would live the life we live. He would be rejected as we've been rejected. He would take on himself every curse that has ever come on humanity. And then he would take that body with all the hurts, with all the wounds and all the curses and all the sin and nail it to the cross and pay the price for every mistake I ever made and every mistake you ever made. Not only did God behold us, he honored us. The mere fact that he would come and be one of us, what an honor that he would come to our level because we could not by ourselves rise up to his level. What an honor. What an honor that he would take my place And what justice says I deserve, God says I'll pay the price for. What an honor that he would go to death so that I don't go to death. That he would pay my price. What an honor that not only did he die for me, the Bible says Jesus was raised up into the heavens. And when he was raised up into the heavens, God elevated our position And we are raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places. What a phenomenal honor. Not only am I forgiven of sin, not only am I uh, uh, given a ticket, a pass to be in heaven. He has seated me in Jesus Christ at his right hand. And then he says, you are co-heirs together with Jesus Christ. You see, God beheld us. He beheld us. He looked beyond our mistakes. He looked beyond our idiosyncrasies. He looked beyond our brokenness and saw that we needed to be loved and we needed to be healed. And then he came down and he honored us by being amongst us, being treated like us, being crucified for us, dying for us, and rising into heaven so that he could raise us up as well. I'm going to take your attention for a moment to Hebrews chapter 1. In verse 1 to 3, it talks about Christ. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by prophets, He has in these last days spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ, 
whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he has made the worlds. Now, talking about Christ, he said he made the world through Christ, who being in the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. So we started in Genesis, and we saw that God created man in his image. And then Adam, the first Adam, fell, he sinned, and the image of God was broken, and we fell from that image, and we've been broken ever since. But here God becomes one of us, and in becoming one of us, he is uh, in the form of Jesus Christ, the exact image of of God the Father. So when Jesus walked on the earth, he was a mirror image of the Father. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. That word image in the Greek is the word icon, a mirror-like representation. It exactly reflects the source. Isn't it interesting that Jesus became the icon of God and he revealed who God was by being like the Father. In every way, Jesus was a mirror image of God. Think about this for a moment. The first Adam, the first Eve were created in the image of God. Listen to me. Look at me. God's original intention was for you and I to be honored with a mirror-like representation of who he is. It's pretty spectacular, isn't it? I mean, we look at nature and we look at some of the animals and we go, gagas, we go, wow. We find out more about the intelligence and the abilities of different animals and we're absolutely amazed and perplexed. That's how heaven was. That's how the whole angelic, creation was when they looked at humanity they saw the mirror image of God before the fall do you know Lucifer fell because he wasn't satisfied with his position in life he said I'm better than God and he wanted he said I will raise my throne up above God you remember that very interesting because he raised himself up or tried to raise himself up above the image of God and he fell and he lost his position and he lost his image. Do you know why Lucifer targeted humanity? When all the good angels in heaven were looking at Adam and Eve and they saw the mirror reflection of God, Lucifer looked and he saw that too. And he said, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be like God. I wanted to be above God. And he saw man crowned with God's image and God's glory. And he said, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to wreck it. I'm going to pervert their image of God. Because if I can pervert the image of God, I will pervert the image of who they are. Hello? And so man became, humanity became Satan's target. And we look around and we interact with broken people. We want to love and we want to be loved. And many times in return, we hurt and we get hurt. And this is the byproduct of what demons do. But in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Jesus came down and he is the mirror image of the invisible God. The same way the first Adam was created in God's image, God said, I'm going to make a plan of salvation, and salvation isn't just about forgiving them of their sins. Salvation is about saving everything that went wrong and making it right again. And so the same image the first Adam was created to live in, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, came in the image of God to restore everything that God had originally intentioned and purposed. Can I get an agreement here? And so I told you that word image is the word icon. 
a mirror-like representation. It exactly reflects its source. Now, this is where it becomes personal. Turn to somebody and say, we're going to get personal. The pastor's going to talk about you right now. Go on, tell somebody. The pastor's going to talk about you. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 11 to 13, it says, He, Jesus Christ, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. What does that mean? The physical body that God prepared was a Hebrew body. It was a Jewish body. And so he came in that body and he preached to his own and his own didn't receive him. But watch this. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do you know that when you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you receive the right, the authority from heaven to be a son of God? You're not just a sinner saved from grace. You see, religion will tell you you're a sinner saved from grace. And we go through life thinking of ourselves as sinners, but I'm saved from grace. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. My sins are forgiven. One day I'm going to heaven. That's the gospel of salvation. That's the gospel of forgiveness. But Jesus came and preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the difference is salvation gets your sins forgiven and gives you a ticket to go back to heaven. But the gospel of the kingdom of God comes to restore the kingdom of God to earth again. And in the restoration of the kingdom of God, God restores man who was in his kingdom and reproduces a new kingdom man. And that's you and me recreated in the image of God once again. Somebody get excited. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, listen to this, born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. You see, we, we make things religious when we don't take God literally. We use the phrase, born of God. Yes, I'm a son of God. And it has a spiritual, religious connotation. It just becomes verbiage. Verbiage. I'm a child of God. I'm born of God. What's interesting in this passage is that God is running a parallel. And he says, you're not born of a human decision. Now, he says, you're not born of a father's intent you're not born of a biological seed he's running the comparison between how you were born the first time how you were born naturally and how you're going to be born the second time and the first time you had no choice in who was going to pass their dna on to you You became the sum total of two individuals' DNA. And you are seed of their seed. You might look like them. You might sound like them. You act like them. My father uh, was uh, obviously is Italian. And you know Italians talk with both hands, right? That's why I wear a wireless microphone. I'd be tongue-tied if I had to hold on to a microphone. But what you don't know is the Italians don't just talk with both hands, they talk with their whole body. You see, when my father talks, uh, you would watch his eyebrows go up and down, and you could tell right away what he was thinking. In fact, uh, when I had eyebrows, I was very much like my father, and my father could be sitting in the living room, and just quietly, no one's in the room. And my mother would walk by and she'd say, who are you talking to? And he said, why? She'd say, because I can see your eyebrows going up and down. <laughs> when I had eyebrows, people used to say that to me. Who are you talking to? And I said, well, how do you know I'm talking to somebody? They said, because we can watch your eyebrows go up and down. 
You see, DNA, you pick up the strengths or even sometimes the weaknesses. We are the sum total of those two biological people that biologically are our parents. Watch. The Bible specifically tells us that if we accept Christ, we are born of God. Why would he use a human analogy and be literal and then talk about a spiritual thing and not be literal? Absolutely. The same way I bore the DNA of my biological parents, when I'm born again, when you're born again, you bear the DNA of your spiritual dad. You are born of God, literally. Turn to somebody and say it. I am born of God. You know, some people in the natural world have heard their parents say, oh, well, we never planned to have you. And they feel like they're a mistake. Can I tell you something? God planned to have you. God planned to have you. There are no mistakes. God planned to have you. And he would do it again. You are born of God. And the Bible goes on to say, uh, <clears throat> if you are born again, you are sons of God. So the first thing we saw was that God so loved the world, he beheld us. He looked beyond our brokenness, and he understood us. He got us. The people that are closest to us sometimes don't get us. And there's nothing more painful than when you're in a relationship and people just don't get you. God beheld us and he got us. Secondly, God ascribed honor onto us. He came down to earth. He identified with us. And he not only identified with us, he took our place. And everything that was bad, he nailed to the cross. Somebody say, come on, Jesus. God beheld us and God honored us. He ascribed honor to us where we had no honor. I'm going to read this scripture. This is an important scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. It says, for those that God foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. There's that word again, image. The image of his son. Now I want to talk about foreknowledge and I want to talk about predestination. Because sometimes people get this back to front. And they have developed this theory, God predestines who he wants saved and who he doesn't want saved. And so God will say, okay, I want you saved. Eh, I don't want you saved. Uh, I might save you. Uh, I might save you, uh, but I don't want to save you. And people think that God predestines our final outcome. Predestination is not about whether or not you're going to be saved. Listen to me, I'm going to say it again. Predestination does not determine whether or not you're going to be born again. God doesn't decide who he's going to accept and who he's going to reject. God beholds us and he accepts us all and he ascribes honor to us even where honor isn't due. If we read this verse in context, it says, Those God foreknew. Have you ever watched a Super Bowl? after it was already played? Have you ever watched it? Some of us have watched it live. How many of you have ever watched a Super Bowl or anything, a Formula One race? After it was done, you went and watched it. God sees that after it was done, before it was done. It's like this. You know, in New York, we celebrate uh, Macy's Parade. And uh, you're watching the parade, you're watching the parade, and as the parade starts, here it comes. But you can't see down the line. 
It's so long, it's so big, it's so glorious. There's no way you can see what's coming unless you have a drone. Unless the TV cameras are hovering on a helicopter high above and you can see the now and you can see what's going to come. God foreknew who would say yes to Jesus and who would say no to Jesus. He foreknew. He saw the parade from heaven. He saw the big picture. He saw the uh, instant replay before the play ever happened. Are you hearing me? So watch this. Those he foreknew, those he predestined. Everyone who chooses to ask Jesus Christ into their heart. In your salvation, part of your destiny is to be recreated into the image of God the Father. You see, we think of salvation. Look at this. We think of salvation. Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. God thinks of salvation as in I am going to restore everything in my kingdom that went wrong. The gospel of salvation only ever preaches about you're a sinner, you're going to hell, Jesus died for you. If you ask him into your heart, your sins will be forgiven. The gospel of the kingdom of God is about restoring everything that the enemy pulled apart and bringing it back to its originality. And so we need to look at our salvation in terms of the kingdom of God. He didn't just forgive me so that I could go to heaven. He forgave me to restore me back into the image that he originally created us in. The original intention comes back into fruition when we ask Jesus Christ in our hearts. I'm not just somebody going to heaven because his sins were forgiven. I am a son of God who has a destiny and a purpose and I am now a mirror image and a mirror reflection of God my Father. The same way you can see Alfonso Scarallo in me. If you knew my biological dad, if you knew my biological mom, some would say, oh, I see Alfonso in him. Others would say, I see Mary in him. And uh, the same way you can see my biological parents and their DNA acting out in me, when we become born again, when we ask Jesus Christ into our heart, we're not just going from sinners to uh, being forgiven by the grace of God. We are reattached to our eternal destiny and brought back into the purpose, and the image that God had intended for us from the beginning. Again, here in Romans chapter 3, 29, it says, conform to the image of, uh, of his son. And that word image is the Greek word icon. We are mirror-like representations of Jesus Christ. So what I'm telling you is this, God beheld us. He deciphered us, he decoded us, he understood us in our brokenness. And then he ascribed honor to us. He made us icons, mirror images, and mirror representations of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, I'm an icon. Some people are icons in their imagination, but you're the real deal. Did you hear me? Some people are icons in their own imagination, but you are an icon in God's imagination. You are an icon in God's plan. You are an icon in God's destiny. You are not a failure. You are a son of God. You've been born again. The reason why Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, how do I get to heaven? How, how, how do I enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, well, you look like the first Adam. You act like the first Adam. You're never going to make it. 
You need a spiritual rebirthing. You bore the DNA of the first Adam, but if you're born again, you accept me and you receive the DNA from your heavenly Father. Hallelujah. You must be born again. Carrying the flag of being grace and faith church won't get you to heaven and it won't change you. Carrying the flag of being a Baptist, a Catholic, or a, a Christadelphian, or an Anglican will not change you. What will change you is allowing Jesus to come into your heart and being born of God, it gives you a new set of DNA. God wants to honor you by putting his likeness over your life. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Praise God for this. I'm running out of time. Because he did, we do. What do I mean by that? You see, God works on the principle. He doesn't talk down to us. He talks up to us. He beholds us. Not what he sees on the surface, the angry, crazy me. He sees the hurt me. He travels back and winds the tape back and sees when I got hurt. What was going through my mind? What was going through my emotions? Why that situation devastated me so much? Why that rejection pulled me apart? He winds the tape back and visits the actual moment and he steps into the scene and he feels what we felt, experiences what we went through, and he decodes us based on the hurts and the wounds he knows we've been through. Wouldn't the world be a different place if we could behold each other and respect and honor and treat people not how they're acting crazy on the surface, but treat people based on a love that sees them in their originality, a wounded individual. Amen. How many of you want to be held? I don't mean how many of you want to be held. How many of you want people to behold you? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hands. Be honest here. God beheld us. And then he honored us. And he has made us into the same image, the mirror-like representation of Jesus Christ. This is a principle of how God works. This is a principle of how the kingdom of God works. When we take the principles of God and we live by those principles, we are changing our atmosphere so that the natural world now must bow down to the spiritual world of God. If you want to change your circumstance, change the principles you live by. I'll say it again. If you want to change your circumstance, change the principles you live by. Jesus taught us to pray and to declare, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If I want things to happen around my life the way they happen in heaven, I have to use the same principles that God uses in heaven to affect my life on earth. Okay? So God beholds us. He looks past the craziness, the hurt, the irrational Rob Scarallo, and he deals with me based on who he knows I, who I was before the trauma. And then he clothes me with honor, and he talks to me. He ascribes honor. He doesn't wait for me to earn it. He doesn't wait for me to get there. He puts honor on me ahead of time because he knows that if he clothes me with honor and helps me to see and experience honor, I will start to live up to what he's called me to, not down to what the enemy reminds me of. So, he beheld us 
and he honored us. What am I saying? The more we learn to behold people and honor them, the more we practice the principles of God, the more we will experience the kingdom of heaven. Good preaching? It's good preaching. We, there are two ways we can operate in this principle. The first, and it's very important, that we operate in this principle towards other people. When you see the crazy me, God forbid, I hope you never do. But when you see the crazy me, I want you to behold me and understand He's human like the rest of us. He's been hurt. He's been disappointed. He's been rejected. And love me from the perspective of who I was before I got wounded. That's what it means to behold. God beheld us. I'm so glad God beheld me. I'm so glad he doesn't treat me how I deserve to be treated. He looks beyond the brokenness sees who I was and who I was meant to be and deliberately chooses me, chooses to treat me with the honor I haven't earned or deserved because he knows that when he clothes me with honor, there's an anointing that comes with honor and that anointing will change you into the image that somebody is casting you in. We need to learn to do this with the people around us. Number two, we need to learn to do this with ourselves. You see, Paul says, and I conclude with this scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. If anyone, no, verse 16, we will regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, we won't see people as they are right now. Because if anyone is in Jesus Christ, the old has gone, the new has come. They are a new creation. In the Greek, that phrase, a new creation, literally means you're a new species. You see, in my biological life, the species I am is son of Mary and son of Alfonso Scarello. But today, I am a new species I am son of God. The son of Mary and the son of Alfonso has some cracks in it. People often have told me, you're cracked. <laughs> it's got some flaws. It has some blemishes. It has some areas that don't function properly. But when I came to Jesus Christ and asked him in my heart, God clothed me with honor and said, now... You are born of my seed, and you bear my likeness. And for the whole time I've been born again, even when I have failed miserably, God has always spoken up to me because he speaks to who I am in Jesus Christ. You and I need to learn to have that type of a relationship with ourselves. We look at our day-to-day -day performance and if we failed, if we've not done well, we get on the same bandwagon as demons do, and we speak down to ourselves. We listen to demons say, you're useless, you failed, you're no good, you shouldn't have done what you did last night, you're such a hypocrite, you're such a make-believe. And we say, amen, 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 amen. And what we're supposed to say amen to is, I am a son of God. God beholds me and he honors me. And I'm going to behold myself not based on my performance. I'm going to behold myself based on Jesus' performance. Amen. Come on, church. Are you hearing me? I'm going to see myself and see who I am as part of the DNA of God. 
Too often I look at Rob Scarrell and I look at him as a result of the DNA of Mary and Alfonso Scarallo. What I need to do, what we need to do, what you need to do is look at Jesus Christ and see ourselves according to the DNA of Jesus Christ. Anyone who is uh, born again, anyone who has accepted Christ is born of God. I'm going to look at who I am in Christ and I'm going to recognize all the attributes that are in Christ and I'm going to say, God, I thank you. Those attributes are already in me and the more I look at him and the more I acknowledge those attributes and the more I understand that I have been clothed in that honor. God has honored me and reproduced me, recreated me back into his image. And the more I acknowledge it, the more I accept it, the more I ascribe that to myself. What do you do with honor? You ascribe it. You write honor with a scribe on another person. And sometimes we need to look in the mirror and take that scribe and write honor on ourselves and see us as who we are in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody give God a big thank you. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? Praise God. Paul says, therefore, we refuse to see somebody after the flesh. Do you get this? Everyone, look, 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 look. Paul's saying, we refuse to see people according to their craziness. We refuse to see people according to their brokenness. We're going to do what God did. We're going to behold. Yeah, there's some crazy there. Yeah, there's some broken there. There's a bit of that in all of us, if we're honest. Right? Absolutely. But we're going to take a principle from God and practice the principle from God so that we can experience the kingdom of God around our lives and I'm going to do it for you I'm going to do it for you I'm going to do it for you and you're going to do it for me and you're going to do it for her and she's going to do it for her and then when we stand in the mirror of our own reflecting thoughts we're going to do it for us and see who we are in Jesus Christ are you with me today, church? Amen. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. If you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, it is so important that you do that. You see, to ask Jesus in your heart is to, number one, give him and perceive him once again in the image that the first Adam didn't see him in. To perceive God as being awesome and wonderful, magnificent, tremendous. First Adam lost his perception of God and he lost his own image. I want you, before you can experience Jesus, you need to recognize he's good, he's wonderful, he's God. And when we recognize the image of God in Christ, and we accept that, and we accept him into our lives, then the image of who we are supernaturally starts to change. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, Jesus said you must be born again. You still smell like the old Adam. We still act like the old Adam. If you have never asked Jesus in your heart and you want to do that today, I'm telling you it's the best decision you'll ever make because you are literally inviting the author of life to come and live inside you. He will wash away every sin and every broken area in your life. He will start to mend. The more you let him in, the more he'll mend. While every eye is closed, 
If you're wanting a relationship like that, if you want to ask Jesus Christ into your heart right now, would you raise your hand nice and high? Thank you. I see that hand. Who else wants to accept Christ? Sir, I see your hand. You can put it down. Thank you. Who else wants to accept Christ? Sir, I see your hand. Thank you. You can put it down. Who else wants to raise your hand? Wants to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Who else today wants to say yes to Jesus and become an icon of Christ? This is awesome. Several people have raised their hands. Church, what do you think of people who say yes to Jesus? It's fantastic. It's fantastic. For those of you that raised your hand and everyone in this room, I want you to repeat a prayer after me. It's the prayer of accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you did this years ago and you've walked away. Great time to come back. Maybe you've never done it. Just as important, just as important that you do it today. Everyone repeat after me. <clears throat> Dear God, Thank you for loving me, beholding me, and honoring me. And today, I behold you. I see how awesome you are. Jesus Christ, I see how wonderful you are. And I'm asking you, Jesus Christ, come into my heart right now, right here, this very day. I want you, Jesus, to live in my life forever. Help me, lead me, guide me. Jesus, I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I've messed up. Forgive me. Wash me. Wash me clean with your blood. I accept you today as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, God, for hearing me. Amen.